Tonight we're doing Days of Yore, and uh, I got drafted into kind of moderating this, and so um, we'll hope that goes well. Uh, we have a star-studded cast, um, names we all know, uh, friends we've known over time, and, uh, and it's interesting that they're community citizens that have made kind of White Lake a very special place. And so uh, they, there are more than uh, the people who obviously are at this table who help White Lake become a great place. Um, one person who was not here tonight, who was going to be here earlier, was Rex Funnel. Uh, he's having a back problem, and uh, he also would have had some good stories. So um, I'm going to introduce basically the ladies first. We have Miriam Gibbs, Blanche Mason, and then we have Dexter King. Rex Funnel's not here. We have Jim Staples and uh, Mayor Henry Bosler. So, um, I have no idea how this is all going to work out, um, but we're going to hear from the panel members. Uh, timing will be a concern, uh, so if someone talks more, we, I figured everybody talks to me about 10 minutes. If you're over 10 minutes, uh, you're going to start testing the audience and maybe get the hook, who knows. Um, and then also, if you can't hear in the background, kind of raise your hand and say that. Also, if you think the person's talked too long, just do the T sign, all right? And, and we'll get the message from up front. Um, and then on the, there'll be questions afterwards, and, and also um, we will handle those at the end of the meeting. Um, I'd like to thank all the members before we even get started for participating, and that also, you know, there will be stories that you hear from some of the different members who you want to maybe ask more questions about later on. And I would say that, you know, we're a very open society, so if you want to call Blanche, if you want to call Miriam or Henry or whatever, feel free to do that uh, for some other reminiscences or, or aspects of the story. Um, I introduced the first lady who was Miriam Gibbs. I don't like the I should have brought my earplugs. <laughs> well, I really shouldn't be here. My husband should be here because he loved this council room and loved White Hall attended everything during the centennial, uh, 50, 100 years. He grew his beard and he was wonderful. He, he, he also was on the council here. His short-term memory was gone, but his long-term memory, he could recite way back to the drugstores and everything else. But I'll do the best I can. Uh, my name is Miriam Markwood Gibbs, and I say Markwood because I figure we're pioneer people here. Markwitz came from Posen, Germany, and maybe they'll see the place over there. Um, they came here <clears throat> uh, and landed in Michigan City. I'll make it quick and short. And then they came to Montague, and when they parked on a boat, they were on a boat outside of Old Channel Inn, where the Old Channel Inn is. My grandmother was lowered by that to the skiff and fell in the water. They had to get through. They walked to Montague. They did small farming, and then eventually they, uh, my grandfather was Gustav Marquardt. They had four children, three boys and a girl. And Gustav was my grandfather, and Pauline was the girl. Um, Gustav buried Albertino, Wilhelmina, Runzel, and settled in Claybanks. <laughs> it was a German community out there at that time. That's not Whitehall. But then, um, just a minute. I'm through with the Marquis. <laughs> Let's go to the get. Oh, I was born on January 7th, 1917, which makes me 93, going on 94. I married Elliot Gibbs from Whitehall. <laughs> Another, uh, my folks came over in 1800, his came in 1600, and they were here a long time. In fact, the King of England gave them a sheepskin and drew the plot of a place in New York State for them to go to. They went to Ireland and then over here. And then eventually they came to Michigan, and there's a book written in my home in western Michigan that. It, Talk, talks about the plank road that came up. They came up that way, not by boat. And it settled um, up at, it was called Peach Ridge. And it's right close to that old house that's standing on the left of Cherry Point. If you drive up to Cherry Point for cherries or anything, it's that old house that's covered with the Gibbs uh, place. They had three boys and two girls, and Frank was one of them. And he moved to Whitehall with his family, and 
built the house on Alice Street, on the corner of Alice and Division, and they raised the children there. Um, several of them, Elliot and Donna, stayed in town. The other three went to Texas and Flint and Ipsy, places like that. Um, the Marquettes, oh, the Gibbs, let's go back to the Gibbses. Because their, their Gibbses are the Whitehall folks. Um, Frank worked for Slocum, Elliot Slocum. He did a lot of corresponding between him. He has many letters that I've seen, uh, well written, and he would deal with Slocum and someone in Whitehall that wanted to buy property. He uh, also worked for Slocum because Slocum built these houses in Bunker Hill and Swedentown, and he would uh, take care of them. He used to have an old paper hang paper cart with big wheels that the children used to play with, but he would haul that. He would paper and paint and fix up these houses. These were for the people from Sweden who lived in Swedentown, down the south end of Swedentown, and that's important too because that's where I moved. Um, I should quit talking because then I lose my train of thought. It's not fun to get old. Um, I moved to Whitehall when I was in the second grade. We had found a house on um, Turns, Old Turns Place. We lived there, then we moved to Swedentown, and we lived in three houses down there. We lived across from Hardy Esterdahl, and next to Dahlstrom's and across from Harvard Lane Green, and we did our shopping at Little at Charlie's Cap. Peterson and Little Charlie's grocery store, if you remember. And we children, there was three of us, we walked to school in the morning, we walked to school home for lunch, and we walked back for the afternoon. Today we'd be bust, but we walked <laughs> back and forth. And I think that's about the favorite places that I remember growing up. Um, the fight garage. Yeah. Well, my dad, the reason we, worked to, we moved to Whitehall was because my father had left the farm and he got a job in the Pike Garage. And the Pike Garage, he was a mechanic along with Cully Myers from Montague and dad worked there. They had a lot of exciting things happen there. It's, it was where the old, it's where the auto store is now. Used to be the Pike Garage. And uh, I remember he brought home one of the first screwdrivers with a hard plastic handle that you couldn't break. And he was showing everybody, you know, they'd come around with things like that. And mother and dad drove cars. They would get maybe four of them in a car and drive down to Detroit. They'd pick up the car that they were supposed to drive home and they would get a box lunch and they never stayed overnight. They'd go down and pick up the car, the box lunch, and came back. Um, a lot of things happened there, but Dad worked there until the Pike moved uptown on Colby and became the Ford Garage. Um, the other thing, the reason I came here was to talk about the Pike Garage. Now I'll get to it. And I'm how are you doing? Am I short? Okay, well. Two minutes left. <laughs> I lost my paper, so I'll just. In 1911, the West Michigan Lakeshore <coughs> Highway decided they needed a road from Chicago to Mackinac. And they didn't know what to do with it, but they decided to call it the West Michigan Pike. They had big signs with half of just the shoreline and they had all the cities, all the cities lined up where you could see Saugatuck and all the rest of them. And they started and they drove this all, it was also, it was also called Michigan Route 66. But this was called the Pike, and that's why the Pike Garage got its name. Someone asked me, they thought maybe it was because they had Pike fish. <laughs> well, you try to figure these things out. But this um, was written up in uh, the museum last year. They had quite an exposition. This man, Stephen J. No, Vincent J. Musi, M-U-S-I is a photographer well known. He has some of his pictures in the National Geographic. And he uh, took this trip of 100 miles and he went from Saugatuck to Muskegon and all of them and he photographed it along the way. Um, I think that's about all I've got to say. Am I, am I all right? Did it go too long? Okay, I think it's fine. Okay. <laughs>
another, another little comment on Miriam was that basically Miriam Smith, she uh, is a wonderful artist, and you'll see her work displayed at the White River Gallery periodically, etc. In the past. She dropped on and I broke my leg. Oh, okay. She dropped out. I have, I forgot to tell you, I'm not here, I can't see any of your faces. So if oh. you know me, come and say hello. Okay. <laughs> Mary, thank you. Um, also, like, the name Marquardt is also a, a White River Township name, and uh, her sister, for instance, is Helen Chase, correct? Yes. Helen and Bill Chase, wonderful, wonderful people, and uh, Helen died recently, but uh, remarkable people. And uh, um, They produced the Chase's calendar of annual events. Used by all. Right, the Chase's calendar, right. Libraries all across the United States. I used to teach out of it. <laughs> okay, next uh, we'll do, uh, thank you, Miriam. Um, we'll go with Blanche Mason. Here we go. Okay, I'm Blanche Mason. I'm a, uh, practically a native of Whitehall. I guess I moved here when I was about a year old. And uh, I was almost a tail end of the family until my Folks decided they would need a native Whitehall person, and my little sister was born. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my chagrin, but I was happy over the years that she was my best friend, and I'm sorry she's gone. Uh, That's Dolly, right? Yes. And I'm the last of my seven brothers and sisters. I'm at home, south seven brothers and sisters. Uh, I chose part of my neighborhood that I knew back before we started naming streets, putting street signs up, and I thought I'd take a trip up Watkins Road, circa 1930. Uh, we started US 31, now Whitehall Road. That was the old 31. And I don't know if the Florence Road was ever US 31, but it was the way to Muskegon way back when. Uh, the first property listed uh, oh, they wrote maybe gravel in the country and paved toward town. Uh, the property listed in an old plant book belonged to Eva Zaksky Norris. Leslie Norris, evidently deceased, had a shingle mill. Eva Norris Whittle was my junior high teacher. The, the schools hired only single or widowed women on a policy, policy and only amended during World War II when most men were grafted. Many teachers I had as single women were back to teaching, and my kids had a couple. Eva was one of the four Anger sisters, dad owning the local meat market. This family, I believe, should be a product for this society, as they have been an integral part of this city. We've done lots of things in this city. And I have, we have uh, Joyce Scott, Lee, Lee Hain, and uh, Rex Funnel is not here, but they're all products from these wonderful women. Uh, going up the road, you come next to Harry Nelson Farm, and all the property on the south side is now the Hickory Knoll Golf Course. All that remains on that north side is a yellow house, and I'm assuming it was the family house of the family hired to help run the farm. We always had some hired families to run, to do the farm work that they couldn't do themselves if you didn't have a big enough family. <laughs> like a lot of the modern farmers have huge families. Uh, the next farm belonged to Fred Watkins, and I have an article from the Skeeton Chronicle dated 1950, written by the countrywide famed, countywide famed Nellie B. Chisholm. So I have a quick little thing from the paper. There was a picture also of old Fred. Uh, Fred Watkins was born in Whitehall, August 1864, has the distinction of living ever since on that same farm. His parent, parents, Jacob and Hannah Watkins, were born in Wales, and soon their marriage came to Whitehall. Soon after their marriage, they came to Whitehall and took a squatter's claim on his farm. With the help of an escaped slave, they built the ball cabin, later replaced by a fine farmhouse in which Fred and his family lived. Many houses were built with lumber that was salvaged when the lumber ship dumped its load into White Lake. In case of illness, someone went on horseback to Muskegon for the doctor, and who would arrive several days later. <laughs> uh, during game were plentiful, so no one went without meat. For many years, Mr. Watkins was associated with H.S. Anderson Packing Company in, in Muskegon in the cattle buying business, and later was an agent for Cohen Roden Tanning Company in Grand Rapids. In 1950, he was still living on that farm. His son, John, was an attorney, 
in Indianapolis and Stella, who remained in the family home after her parents' death. The property was sold and the house was torn down and replaced by a new one. My dad and Fred had an ongoing association. I'm a little farm girl living in the city. <laughs> Our farm was in the city. Uh, we had four or five cows and he had a bull. When the cow went dry, my dad would walk the cow over to spend the overnight with Fred's good bull. <laughs> if the result of this tryst was a heifer, we kept it. If it wasn't, it soon graced our dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> Women slept. Um, with, with Fred's association with the meatpacking company and Grand Rapids Tannery, I'm assuming that the cow found too old to reproduce would be delivered to Fred. Across the road from the Watkins was a large farm situated on a gully that was owned by Matt's Sump, Matthew's Sump, and a fence divided our property from theirs. The barn held the milk cows that were part of Sump's business as a local dairy. That barn was on what Jacob's family moved into, uh, not the barn, but they built the property they bought. Uh, so we held uh, Sump's business was a as, a, as a local dairy. The cooling shed and bottling outfit were further up the road by the water tower, along with, with the family home. They supplied milk door to door from a wagon and from a sledge in winter, replete with sleigh bells, along with the clinket bottles. The Zumps were originally from Austria, and my mom would be a frequent caller on Mrs. Zump. The ladies would do their visiting in German, as my mother was fluent and had to learn German as a presence in Vienna. I'm a first generation of America, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, on the south side stands a White House at the end of Peach Street that was owned by Perry Holden, who has who had a large white house now rent a bit further up the road. The smaller house was a tenant farmer's house, and our mailboxes were RFD number one, a good a good distance from our house. Um, this, um, uh, Professor Holden, I gotta get my ducks in a row here. I had many fruit trees, so mom and us kids would pick fruit in season for canning. My memories was of a man who would admonish us not to break any limbs, making him kind of scary. Tall, tall, thin man with a white goatee. This gentleman was a pioneer in farming education circles in the Midwest. I googled his name and found a couple of laudatory articles about him. The farm was his, was his retirement place. So I'll read this little piece I got from the internet. Uh, P.G. Holden was born in Dodge Center, Minnesota, studied at the Michigan State University. At that time, it was the Michigan Agricultural College. And he was awarded MS in 1895. Subsequently, he went to the University of Illinois at Urbana and Champaign, where he became an assistant professor for soil physics and the first professor of agronomy got to get that right, of the U.S. from 1896 until 1900. For the next two years, he served as manager of Funk Brothers Seed Company, promoting the use of hybrid corn seeds. In 1902, he joined Iowa State University, first as vice dean of agriculture, and then in 1906 was head of the ISU Extension Service. Through his various outreach programs to promote the use of hybrid corn seeds, he became known as the Corn Evangelist. He also was instrumental in solving the, the bull wheel, bull wheel problem down south with cotton. Uh, he ran for governor of Iowa in the Republican primary. After his defeat, he moved to Michigan again, where he became director of International Harvesters Agriculture Extension Department. He retired in 1932. He was married to Carrie Ann and Amelia Burnett. They had four children. One of them died as an infant. And I was also aware, or have been thinking, known all quite a few years now, that uh, the communists, way back when, in Russia, had a five-year uh, agriculture program. And I hear we heard a story that uh, Professor Holden was the one that uh, devised that program. I don't know how well they did, but. And he was nice, though. The next house down the street belonged to C.O. Morgan. All I know about him is that he had two children, Walter and Evelyn Meekle, who raised her family in that house. 
We come to what is known as Warner and Alice, and on the northeast corner is another old house. When I was in school, it was owned by the Malackers with two daughters around my age. The place is now owned by Rodney Olson, who has an eye, has an eye popping vegetable and flower garden. I'm going to buy her greatly. Across the Warner was the chicken farm for Chris Taub. Halt, another German immigrant. I raised a big family. A school bought the property, built the football field, and what used to be the new high school. One of their sons died in World War II. Uh, south along Alice tree were trees and a gully all the way to Division. The north side was where the school was situated with some private ownership, no, no buildings. On the corner of Alice and Division stands the Van Curen House that is presently occupied by Mayor Mac Hatch. Hatch. Mac Hatch. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was part of the Ruggles group of houses on Division. The Van der Purens owned a part of the farm we bought, so we, on occasion I would walk over with my mom to make a mortgage payment. The friendship between Mrs. Van Curen resulted in a naming of my last sibling after Adele Van Curen. Kitty Corner was from there was a Gibbs house. The house was torn down recently, but the little red house remains and is in the home of Tanya Kabbalah, our councilman who can claim the Gibbs as kin. The Gibbs own most of the block back to Lincoln Street and the house there belongs to Walters and Potter. I went to school with a couple of the Gibbs clan. On the corner of Mears and Alice was an Eastern's auto dealership run by Oliver and Harry. We bought a car from them around that time. Having no cars to sell during World War II, they rented a part of the building to the U.S. Ration Board. In 1943, I was employed there until they closed the office and moved it to Muskegon. I rode my bicycle to work every day. It's a nice and handy. I couldn't do that when we moved to Muskegon. <laughs> so on the other corner was the Moog House. The first Moog is listed as having a furniture store. Uh, the last Moog was Ferris, who was in school with my older siblings. The house was torn down and the lot vacant for a few years, and there now is a new house on that spot. My Watkins Road is now paved end to end, and they call it Alice Street after Mr. Gwynn, our city manager, managed me to put up all the street signs. Uh, the newer homes, there are many, many, many newer homes that are filled in all the empty spaces, so it's an interesting street, it's a busy street. So I was raised in the country, and my kids were raised on the same property I was, they were city kids, so. <laughs> and what else can I say? I guess that's enough, thank you. <laughs>
I don't know why it wasn't pasteurized. I don't know how come I'm still living. <laughs> but, but you know, I celebrated this year my 97th birthday. <laughs> and I went to start school, well, to begin with, the house that we bought had three bedrooms on the south side and a kitchen, living room, and and a parlor on the north side. And I know today, people don't get a house unless it's got a, a, a heater, and it's got air conditioning, and it's got a nice kitchen that's fully equipped with a refrigerator and, and, and all the stuff. We didn't have that. We had a kitchen stove to heat the back part of the house, and we had a hard coal stove that was in the living room. And the hard coal stove took two buckets of hard coal in the morning and two at night. And it burned all night. And it was beautiful. The rays from it was, we always sat there and watched it when we were waiting to go to bed. Anyway, we didn't have any bathroom, so we had an outhouse, three, three whole outhouse in the backyard. <laughs> And we didn't have any place to take our baths, so on Saturday morning we heat the water on the kitchen stove and get the old wash tub out and take our baths in the old wash tub. But I'll tell you, it was a beautiful, beautiful life. Uh, when I was five years old, I went to the, the high school, and I don't know how many of you remember this high school, but. Uh, I remember it so well because my father and mother both graduated from that school and my sister Doris and Junior and I, grad she graduated in 29, Junior and I graduated in 30, and Bertha graduated in 32. And both of my daughters went there until they tore it down. <laughs> I, I got pictures of, of the tearing the building down. It was built in 1878, and they tore it down in 1960. But I tell you, I had an awful lot of fun in that school. <laughs> and, of course, once in a while we got reprimanded for sliding down the banister. But the reason I guess they tore that building down is the fact that the toilets and, and showers were in the basement, and there were no toilets on the second and third floor. But there was a beautiful bell up in the tower, and on, in the morning it rang for one minute when they rang the bell. So if you were getting up late, you better run like mad to be there on time. And I, I, uh, I had teachers that I remember. I remember the teachers that were the toughest. There was double clicked in the second grade, and Franny heard in the fourth grade, and uh, even Norris in the seventh grade. And then we had Mrs. Dodge for English, and she was pretty tough too, but we liked her because she put on many plays at the playhouse that we took part in. And when I got uh, of age to play football, I said to my mother, I weighed 120 pounds, ring and what? And I said to my mother, can I play football? And she said, no, you're too small. I said, can I ask my dad? She says, yes. So I asked my dad, and he said, Hell yes! <laughs> so I played football, but I knew in the ninth grade that I probably wouldn't do much playing, but at least I would be there to help scrimmage against the varsity and make them a better team. But uh, I played the rest of three years in high school, and I played baseball, and I played run in the track. You know, we were so small that what few of us there was, we had to do all these things. <laughs> there was only 17 in my graduating class. And 
They built a, a gym to this school in 1924. In the first two years, they wouldn't let me in, the, in to play because I was too small. But I did play when I was a, a junior and a senior, and I, I remember that I was on the all honor team. Wow. So I said, you know, I have so many happy memories of that school. However, the football team, when we went out to practice, we had that field that was east of the school, and it was all sandbirds. You know, we didn't have the nice facilities that they had now. And when we got ready to play, we had to run from this school up to Funnel Field, because that's where we played our games. They didn't have a bus to haul us up there. But, Nevertheless, we had a lot of fun. And when I was uh, 13 years old, my brother and I decided that we wanted to make some money, so we took on the Chronicle Road. He had to sign the papers, and uh, George Koval had to, had to uh, sign for the bond. We had to get a bond in order to get it. And that time, the Muskegon Chronicle was selling for 12 cents a week or 52 cents a month. Now, I like peddling. We had the all of Whitehall down as far as, as uh, Nystrom's garage. Bunker Hill in Sweetentown, we didn't have until later on. But Junior and I in the summer worked at Pitkins on the popcorn machine. First, first Pitkins had a popcorn machine that sat on Colby Street just outside of the entrance. And then later, it got so that we were so busy that they put a piece of concrete on Peters Avenue and bought a bigger one that you could get in and sit in. And then we roasted peanuts behind us in the unit and made popcorn face it. But we, we uh, between working for Pitkin's popcorn machine and the Chronicle, Junior and I bought our first car, oh a 1929 Model A, six hundred dollars. Oh, I tell you, we had fun. But 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 you know, uh, when I was growing up. Uh, my father worked for Mr. Glazer on Colby Street uh, in the uh, grocery store. And when I was about seven, six, seven, I used to go downtown on, on the avenue. There was always a, a lot of snow piles on the street. The sidewalks were always shoveled. But on the snow piles in the, in the street were all, always a bunch of sparrows. And my brother and I, we tried to catch them. We didn't have much luck. But Mr. Glazier said to us one day, he said, I'll tell you boys, if you get some salt and put some salt on their tail, you'll get them. Well, we tried it, but that didn't work. <laughs> and I remember uh, we used to hook a ride with a, a farmer going from Whitehall to Montague, we'd take our, our sleds and we'd hook onto them and take a ride to Montague, then we'd wait and get another one that was coming back to Whitehall. <laughs> and we'd do that two or three hours. But one day we was all standing on Pitkin's Corner when Merle Whitbeck from Montague came in with his team and he told us that his horses were two years old, so they were pretty frisky. But he says, come on, kids, get on board. So we all got on the back end of that wagon. He took us up Colby Street, up as far as City Hall as now. We slewed around and we came back down. He was going to make Mears Avenue, turn Mears Avenue, and he slewed, so I thought he was going right through Pitkin's front window. <laughs> but he took us down to the Mufer Adams Playhouse and swung us around and brought us back to Pitkin's Corner. He said, everybody off, that's your ride for today. <laughs> and if, when we, we were old enough to go down to the lake, uh, 
skiing or skating. You know, we didn't have those kind of skates that are shoe skates now. The skates we had fastened down to our shoes and my ankles were always weak. So I was riding on my ankles half of the time. But we'd go down to, to the lake with shovels and some of the older boys were there too. We shoveled a place to skate and then the older boys would sneak over to the tannery and snitch some bourbon oil barrels and bring them back and line them up. Clark, Clark White, Paige White, and Bob Johnson, see how many of those barrels they could jump. And the, the, the ones, couple of ones that they didn't put in that circle, they set on fire so we had some heat and some light. And when they got through skating, they did take those barrels back that they were trying to skate over. So we had a lot of fun. And you know, we didn't run around begging somebody to fix the ice wars. We went down and did it ourselves. When we wanted to go uh, sledding, we went down to the corners of Sophia and Mears, where the Lewis house sits on the corner. And we went down that hill. And if we went belly flopping, we got a good start. And we made the corner at the bottom, but you had to be careful that you didn't run into the depot that sat at the bottom of the hill. We made that corner, and we went about halfway to where the Lake Street went under the railroad tracks, but it was always quite a walk back, you know. Well, so much for that stuff, you know. How many of you do remember the, the minstrel show at the old high school? Well, you know, we put that on three or four years, two nights a week, and we, we made a thousand dollars for the music department. But all of a sudden, the colored people in Muskegon put a big swat and we had to stop. Now, you know, I always admired the colored people because they were always happy, go lucky, dancing, singing, and so forth. And I didn't think we were making fun of them, you know. We were trying to be like them, you know. And, of course, uh, my brother and I took some, uh, took a few uh, things on, on the thing. I always dressed up as a lady. <laughs> I always dressed up as a lady. And, and here I... <laughs> There, I was singing, Ma, he's making eyes at me. <laughs> and, and then this one, I, I, I have a baby. You know? But I'll tell you, we had so much fun on the, on the minstrel show. How many, how many of you remember the baseball team that played every Sunday afternoon up at Funnel Field? Yep. <laughs> well... You know, I, I, I've kept a lot of these things uh, as I, I've kept, uh, to begin with, I kept a, a picture of, of uh, Colby Street in 1918, and it just, it, it, you can see, we had a lot of snow during those days. And, uh, I, and I also kept some, some things that went on at the Newford Adams Playhouse. Florida Bound was put on by Charlie Seeger. And some of you, I'm sure, know the people that were in it because it was probably in the early, or late 30s that these were done. He put on Florida Bound and he put, put on the Enchanted Garden and uh, Frank, uh, Adams put on the Black Parade. We put it on for two nights and then we took it to Fremont for one night and took it to Ludington for one night. And they wanted us to take it to Holland, but the, most of the people were working. So uh, we had to tell them no, we couldn't do it. Here's a smuggler man that was put on by the school in 1921. 
and I'm sure you people will know a lot of the people that were in this. And I have a copy of the Whitehall Community Theater that was 1916, and I'm sure some of you know those people too. And how many of you people know and remember in my old telephone directory? <laughs> Mine was 37W and the pipe garage was 38. And uh, you know, uh, I, those a lot of people had telephones, but they they had them on a on a on a line, so you didn't know you may have had 14 people on the same line that you had. And uh, when you're in a conversation, you hear the phones pick up, some of your neighbors wanted to see what was going on. <laughs> well, I, I kept this telephone directory, and that's 1935. So, you know, a lot of these things are interesting to me, and I don't know if they're interesting to anybody else or not. I even kept a, a thing that was for the the uh, Wabin Eagle Jinx down at Silver Beach. I, it, it was 1911. So I have that copy of that. And I remember very well that when Dad built that garage uh, on the corner of Mears, or of uh, Division and Colby, that he had a beautiful room in the front for displaying cars and then there was a great big place for repair shop that, that you heard Miriam talk about. I worked with her dad there one time. And then they had behind that a nice big room for storing cars. Some of the people in the summertime left their cars here. So it was heated garage. Well, in 1930 about 1932-33, we had a small orchestra that was started from, from uh, our graduation from school. And so we asked Matt if we couldn't use that front room to have dance. And he said, sure. So we bought a small piano. And my wife-to-be, Marie, sold the tickets. It cost you 10 cents to get in. And sometimes we had a hundred people in there. They were all young people. And, and some of the Boy Scouts from the Wasp camp come in. And some of the boys that were up here from Lawrence Hall in Chicago, when they were up here, they came to the dance. So every Monday, before the dance on Tuesday, we'd get an air mail letter from Lawrence Hall requesting that we play a certain number for him and to say hello to Florence Esterling and, and to, to say hello to Wickstrom and, and I, I don't remember all the girls. I got I got the letters but all I got with me was was an envelope. Uh, so, you know, and of course I also kept some of my Stamps, the washing stamps. I kept some of those, and I kept a picture of the uh, some of the ships that used to bring passengers up from the resorts, and they they were down at the station at the bottom of Colby Street. There was a little dock insert, and I remember that dock so well because I almost lost my younger daughter when she was four, four years old. She, uh, my wife was over across the street from where we lived, helping her. She was a cripple. And Janet and the Pelon boy were playing in the yard. She said, no, you don't leave the yard. I'll be right back. And they decided they wanted to go down to Pitkins to see the Christmas tree in the window. So they took off and went down to Pitkins, and when they got to Pitkins, they decided they wanted to go down and see the lake. So they walked down the hill. And on that dock, she was working on it, and of course, this 
was slippery, and she fell in. Well, this was the first time they had uh, trailers there, and there was a lady that had just come off the Continental Motors night shift, and she was sweeping off her drive, and the pipeline boy went over and said, there's a girl fell in the water, and she came over and picked her up, and I can see her yet, carrying her up Main Street, up Kirby, and my wife and Mrs. Peline coming down looking for her. Took her up to Dr. Callier's office, and he pumped some of the water out of her, said, take her home, and then he stopped at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, Janet, if you ever do that again, I'm going to paddle your little behind. <laughs> And he never charged me a cent, not a cent. Well, I think I, I pretty well exhausted my time. Oh, yes. I sang with the barbershop quartet, two of them, in the minstrel show. This was when I sang with Paul, Paul Simonson, Bill Simonson, and Chuck Lipke, and I was singing the lead. And then I sang one with Marty Nyberg and Keith Olds and Wes Weedoff. Of course, they're all gone now. <laughs> okay. Dexter, thank you. Um, Dexter has lots of, I can just see, I haven't seen them, but like lots of photographs and things like that. And I would think that if there's someone in the audience who wants to learn more about White Lake history, that they ought to come back and spend some time and maybe uh, take Dexter, uh, et cetera. Also, Dexter, you know, the information on the Newford Adams Playhouse, Cindy Beth Davis is in charge of the Playhouse. They've restarted the White Lake Dramatic Club, and they would, I, I'm sure she would love to talk to you about the Playhouse activity. Uh, there's always more to say. Uh, okay. Next we go with, uh, Rex Funnel was going to be the next one, but he's not here, so we will go to Jim Staples, and I'll just say, take it away, Jim. Thank you, Roger. Uh, my reminiscences um, fall into but roughly three categories. Uh, Colby Street businesses, the old timers, families, and homes, and the last sawmill on White Lake. I lived in Grand Rapids uh, during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, and my family spent almost every weekend, spring through fall, at 222 Mears Avenue, which was the, uh, my father's home. And my grandmother uh, still lived there until she died in 38. My mother's brother, Carl G., operated the G and Carr hardware store at the northeast corner of Colby and Mears, which I think is now the uh, furniture outlet store until his death in 1955. Uh, Carl was from a hardware family. He had an older brother, Merle, younger brother, Lynn. Uh, I don't think the what single store was big enough for both of them, so uh, Merle went to um, Fremont, had a hardware store, and then he went to Lowell and had a hardware store. And uh, uh, Merle's granddaughter, um, Nancy, a porter, and her husband, John, have come down from uh, Traverse City to be at this uh, gala affair tonight. And then um, there's also Mary G, who was uh, Everett uh, G, uh, um, Kyle G's granddaughter, and Janine Heibel. And I haven't got her relationship quite straightened out, but she's in the granddaughter category too. <laughs> so that's quite a representation from the G family here tonight. The G and Kyle hardware store, I'm sure, was a typical small town hardware store. It had long wooden floorboards which creaked and every imaginable hand tool from shotguns to pitchforks hung from the wall pegs. Nails were displayed in a multi-layered Lazy Susan at the rear of the store in the six, eight, 10, 12 penny trays. And I measured out many five pound bags of 10 penny nails and I also put a couple of extra in. The home decorating center was in the rear of the store, which included 20 or 30 pigeon holes, each filled with wallpaper, which Carl's, wife's, which Carl's wife, Olivia, we all knew her as Ollie, uh, showed to customers. The store was open to at least 6 o'clock on Saturdays because many farmers came in after 5 p.m. to make their purchases. I noticed that often the men were accompanied by their wives who purchased from a handheld list. And when the sale was rung up, rung up, 
the exact sum was produced by the wife, who I suspect had made an earlier scouting trip. All sales were cash except for a few which were on account. Uncle Carl showed me racks and racks of store copies of the on account sales, which he knew would never be paid, but he never refused a sale. At the end of the each day, the big cash register would be emptied, except for the penny compartment. Pennies were thrown into a large wooden Remington shotgun shell case kept under the, uh, under the uh, register. Upon uh, Carl's death, the pennies were counted out at the Whitehall State Bank and amounted to over $500 worth, and they included a number of Indian head pennies. <laughs> Carl couldn't be bothered with the pennies. Carl, Uncle Carl also ran an ambulance and funeral service business at the rear of the building, which was traditional at that time, and I think traditional across America, uh, for the small town hardware merchant to be the, uh, the ambulance uh, proprietor. Uh, my older brother Henry accompanied uh, Henry Rossler, or another adult, probably Everett G., on uh, two ambulance runs in the huge black Packard that they had. Um, I remember Uncle Carl, uh, towards the end of the summer, uh, summer uh, uh, congratulated my brother Henry. He said, you're batting a thousand, because uh, my brother had gone on two ambulance runs. Well, the first one was a pathetic case. A lady was so, so sensitive that it took four people each at a corner of a sheet to load her into the ambulance because she was uh, so sore, and she died. And then here's another story that uh, Henry may have to uh, modify or, or confirm. Uh, apparently somebody was missing when they went fishing up in Carlton Creek in the hot August. And he was missing for two or three weeks, but finally he was discovered two or three weeks later in the, the swamps in Carlton Creek. And my brother went with either Henry or somebody down there and uh, when they got to the place, why um, my brother was told to go back to the um, big black Packard and, and bring an oil cloth, a shovel, and a bucket. See? <laughs> True? Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Were you the one? Yeah. <laughs> I remember my Uncle Carl making many telephone calls to line up pallbearers, and I deduced that the small town hardware store was a more prominent social interchange than drug, grocery, and clothing stores combined are today. Everybody I had apparently had to go to the hardware store at least once a week. Next to the hardware store to the east was um, Carl G's five and ten cent store, whose only product of interest to me uh, was the orange, yellow, and white corn candies made of 110 percent sugar. <laughs> The next store east was Mr. Dauber's drugstore, which carried the essentials, but not the frills, of Pitkins. Uh, Mr. Dauber was a very gentle man and a very nice man. I have very good memories of him. I'm, I wonder where his family is. Then came Ray Funnel's Barbershop, and uh, reference has been made, and I very well remember um, going into that barbershop. My dad would kind of get his hair long so he could have Ray Funnel cut it, and we went out in, to what is now Funnel Field and watched the baseball games. And then about the fifth inning, Ray would come by with his, with his little cap and go through the stands, and Dad would toss a dollar in. And that's the way they supported the team. Um, oh, next to the um, uh, Funnel's Barbershop was the hotel with the uh, white brick and green trim, which uh, I think burned down in the late 1940s. We used to go there for Sunday dinner. And all I remember was that they had those uh, ears of uh, corn on the cob, and they always got it cut awful small towards the end. I don't think they had a very good <laughs> supply of corn. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Leonard and Edna's uh, meat market and grocery store was across the street from the hotel. Leonard was the butcher, and he operated on a two and a half by two and a half foot uh, maple butcher's block, and Edna handled the groceries. And I always wondered why Edna would always put his thumbs by his uh, waist as he was waiting for the uh, scale to show up, but, you know, showing, showing the honesty of the, of the butcher. <laughs> On Saturday evenings, uh, we would have a chocolate soda in Pitkin's Sunken Garden at the rear of the store, and that was a very spiffy place. I've been in there now, and I can't turn around without knocking something <laughs> 
that the State Bank of Idaho was owned and run by cousin George Koval, who once counted out the incredible sum of $500 to me. It was open about four and a half hours a day from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., and I'm not even sure it was open Saturday. Across Colby from Pitkins, and about where the Sweet Traditions shop at 108 West Colby is today, was the insurance office of my cousin Guy Koval, who leased the front half to Western Union behind the same long counter. I was amazed at how one man could do four things at one time. He would read the wire, type the message, smoke a cigarette, and participate in the conversation between Guy and my dad. <laughs> We were always in town for the Viking Festival in the fall, when a Viking ship was pushed off from the city dock ablaze with a huge fire, which represented a funeral pyre for a Viking in the days of yore. I particularly recall, <laughs> pardon me, I particularly recall one festival when my dad and I lagged behind mother coming, uh, walking up uh, Colby, as we looked up trying to pick out the big and small dippers. Uh, when one of many inebriated uh, yachtsmen with those fancy caps asked my mother, what you doing tonight, babe? <laughs> to which my father instantly responded, she was taken tonight. <laughs> the final family members of the old-time families were still alive in the 30s and 40s. Lyman Koval of the Staples and Koval Mill died in 1916. After his first wife died, he married a young lady I knew only as Aunt Mame. Lyman and Aunt Mame had a daughter, Emmeline, and mother and daughter lived in a grand Victorian home just south of Pitkins with a wide wraparound porch where the Verizon phone building and the photography studio are today. Emmeline was a tall, striking woman, very handsome, who never married. My parents said she devoted her life to looking after her mother. Our home at 222 South Mears Avenue was directly across Slocum Street from the Playhouse, which showed movies every Friday and Saturday night. The smell of popcorn was pervasive and powerful. I remember seeing the Nelson, Eddie, and Jeanette McDonald movies there, and particularly Eddie singing, Give me ten men who are stout-hearted men, and I'll soon give you ten thousand more, and so on. I also remember the low-cut gown on Jeanette, or one of the other beautiful ladies in the cast, the Lindemann House stood in what is now the PNC Bank Building parking lot. It was purchased by Carl G. in the late 1940s, and it was his last home. It had dark mahogany paneling in the first floor library. I'd never quite figured out what Mr. Lindemann's business was, but there was so much machinery in the area, sawmills, etc., and there was a foundry. I think he had a machinery building or repairing business. Anyway. Next to the Lindemann House was George Koval's home. Uh, it stood where the PNC Bank building is today. It was another elegant Victorian with a wide wraparound porch. I remember dinner in the large dining room when George's wife, Clara, brought in the meatball main dish to which I announced uh, that there were three and three-seventh meatballs per person. <laughs> My uh, grandfather, uh, James J.G., now James J.G., also known as Jimmy G. to his uh, contemporaries, was the father of Carl, the three boys, Merle, Carl, and Lynn. Um, uh, built a very late Victorian style house at the uh, southeast corner of Spring Street and Mears Avenue, which had five different woods in the dining room and a secret passageway from the street level to the attic in the back. James G. had three sons, I mentioned Merle, Carl, and Lynn, and he told my grandmother if she would give him a daughter, he would build her a new house. My mother was born in 1896, and James, true to his word, built the house. Uh, John Lettick told me the story in which uh, James' sister, uh, who married Mr. Lettick of Montague, uh, would sell eggs and butter to my grandmother, her sister-in-law, once a week. One time, my grandmother told her sister-in-law to come to the side door on future visits. Needless to say, that was the last time Mrs. Lennick ever stopped by. <laughs> my mother inherited the home, and she, or more accurately, my dad, rented it for years. When gas rationing occurred in World War II, 
We couldn't get to White Hall very often. Dad decided to call on the renters on one trip to discuss their long overdue rent payments. He found them absconded and the house trashed. Reluctantly, he sold the house for $3,000 in about 1944 and 1945. And the purchaser, or successor, then sold to someone who erected the current architectural masterpiece, that square one-story cinder block building which houses the post office. <laughs> Guy Cole and his wife Effie lived in the 1884 home at the northeast corner, southeast corner, of Mears and Slocum. Right. which is now the White Swan Inn. And I recall several dinners there, including one where I came face to face with custard pie. Guy attended West Point after graduating from Whitehall High School, but he did not enjoy wearing ties, stiff collars, and other indicia of a regimented system. He was a very good student, did well in classes, but at the end of his freshman year, he had accumulated so many demerits for sloppiness, etc that he would be walking them off throughout his sophomore year. He accordingly said goodbye to his fellow freshman classmates, including Douglas MacArthur, and came back to Whitehall. Charles P. Seeger, who was mentioned earlier, lived on Slocum Street, uh, about one and a half uh, blocks east of Mears Avenue. He was a bachelor, an excellent cook, and had the biggest collection of pipes I ever saw. Charles was a composer in the Tin Pan Alley era, and wrote, I wonder who's kissing her now, I wonder who's teaching her how, and so on, and other songs for Broadway shows. Florence Lewis, the only child of John G. Lewis and her husband, Wes Hodges, who was a society dentist in St. Louis, spent summers in the Lewis house just south of the Playhouse. I think of her as a friendly grand dame. She had a somewhat regal bearing, but she loved a good time, and she and my mother were often in cahoots. Several times, we all went to Schiller's Barn Dance, where we danced the Swedish Hummel. That dance began with three long, graceful, waltz-like sweeping steps, which carried a couple to the end of the room. This was followed by a mad dash to the starting point, trying to beat the 100-yard dash record to begin again. Florence and my mother always attended the old settlers' brunch until apparently there was an acute shortage of old settlers. <laughs> Florence had a live-in companion, Gertrude. But the question in our family was, was Gertrude looking after Florence or was Florence looking after Gertrude? After Gertrude and Wes Hodges both died, Florence married Mr. Gauthier. My mother enjoyed telling the story about the clause in the prenuptial agreement with Mr. Gauthier, who was at least 15 years younger than Florence, maybe more, which stated that Mr. Gauthier would have no bedroom privileges. <laughs> In return for looking after her, he was to receive a million dollars on her death. Florence, at her death, left a million dollars to a retirement home in St. Louis and another million dollars to a retirement home in Palm Beach, where she spent uh, many of her last years. She wanted to leave a million dollars to a retirement home in Whitehall, but there was no suitable donee. Uh, hence, the manager of the Hume home in Muskegon picked up the phone one day, and Florence's estate lawyer told him the Hume home was the recipient of a million dollar gift. Imagine the surprise at the other end of the line. In the summer of 1942, my brother Henry and I and my, our dad walked down Slocum Street to the peninsula where the Crosswinds Restaurant and Marina is now located. Mr. Jack Lyons, owner of a marine construction business, uh, and also owner of the Lion's Den, you know, as you go on South Shore Drive, you see the Lion's Den off on the east side. Um, Mr. Lyons had set up a sawmill on the first 60 or 75 feet of level ground after the downward incline uh, of the anthrophane. The mill had vertical wood board sides and, if I recall, a shingled roof and contained a large circular saw in a planing mill. I can still hear the whine of the saw as it cut two inches by four inches by eight foot long pieces of lumber from eight foot logs. <coughs> the rough two before us then went through the noisy, roaring planing mill where it would emerge as a one and three sixteenth inch 
by three and three, 13 16 inch by eight foot smooth piece of lumber which you could handle with your bare hands. At the end of the peninsula where the Crossland restaurant now has uh, you know a little porch where you can eat and look out over the lake um, was a hulk uh, which reminded me of a clipper ship of the 1850s but without any masts. Mr. Lyons planned to tow the hulk to the upper peninsula load it with logs tow it back to Whitehall, and keep his sawmill humming. My brother and Dan and I stood there, and my brother pleaded with my dad to let him ship out on the Hulk uh, uh, as a saver for the coming summer, and I could see Dad was weakening. The rehabilitation crew were hammering some spikes into the side of the hull, and they go bang, bang, and then a third bang, bang. In other words, it was dry rot for about eight inches after the first half inch of good timber, see. Um, the spike went in like it was penetrating butter. And the only thing Dad said was, forget about it. <laughs> and my brother had to get a of going to Annapolis two years later. Um, I've, always, I've often thought that this uh, last sawmill on White Lake would be a great subject for a senior thesis in the English department at Whitehall High School. And I, so, I hope somebody picks up the suggestion someday, because the lumber era did not end in 1907 with the closure of the Staples and Cobo Mill. It really had about a three-month three revival in 1942 at the foot of Slocum Street. Okay. Well, that's my remembrance of something. If, if the members of the G family are here, generation, generation, down, down, uh, would they stand up? The G's are, okay. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, landmarks and landmark people. Um, speaking of landmarks. <laughs> I think I'm the kid at the table. I'm not sure. You're, am I older than you? I'm going to hit 80 pretty soon. Well, I'm older than you. You're the kid. <laughs> well, let me just say that uh, with my brother's great-grandchildren, we've been in this area for seven generations now because our great-grandparents came here in 1899 and built a home on Hancock in Montague Township. And uh, my grandfather married my grandmother, who was a daughter to uh, Henry and Margaret Sieben, and built a house, a log house, on that same piece of property. How many of you know the what I still call the uh, Harry Block log house on Hancock? There's a log house on Hancock. Well, right across the street was the original Sieben farm, my grandmother's father's farm. And they had, Grandma and Grandpa built a log house just like Block's house. But it caught fire in 1910 and burned to the ground, taking the barn and the chicken house and everything with it. So Grandpa decided there wasn't any place to make enough money to build again here, so he moved to Chicago, took his uh, kids, my father and his two sisters, Dad had gone to school at the school on Post and Hancock, where they sell um, asparagus. Now he's got a little, that house on the northeast corner was the school that my dad went to when they were on the farm. Anyway, make a long story short, uh, Grandma and Grandpa came back <clears throat> uh, to the farm after Grandpa made enough money to get uh, going again. And uh, then my dad was in a severe accident in Chicago uh, and, and uh, couldn't work anymore and decided that we were going to move back to the farm. So we moved back to the farm in 1942. But it was like being at home because I had spent every Christmas, every Christmas, every summer that I can remember. Um, and I have pictures showing me even before I can remember on the farm with uh, the great-grandmothers and staying at their house. So I was in Michigan all summer in the, from my childhood until we moved back. 
And so it was always seemed like that was more of a home than Chicago was. But you can imagine my dad married a girl who was from Chicago. And although mother had been up in the summertime with great grandma and grandpa, she knew what the rigors of country living were. But if you can imagine that when my dad could no longer operate, uh, he had a severe skull fracture and uh, was incapacitated for several years, to move from Chicago where she had running water, central heat, transportation, electricity, to a three-room home that my dad and I built, 24 by 24, with a coal stove in the one room. And there was a small bedroom for my one brother, uh, Don, who was, Wayne was born when we were here. And a larger bedroom for my folks, and then one big room, which was the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, and whatever else. But mother made it. She adjusted the, we had a, we had a three-holer, <laughs> and we had carpeting on it, <laughs> carpeting, and my grandmother's was even greater than that because she had wallpaper in hers. <laughs> I'll have to tell you, maybe I should, well I will. Grandpa used to drop a piece of newspaper in the hole before he sat down in the winter time kind of warmed it up a little bit. So I thought I would do that. Well, if you don't get that paper down far enough, when it flares up, it not only warms you, but it gets you off the hole, I can tell you. Well, <laughs> but we didn't get electricity. Uh, in fact, we didn't get electricity until uh, 1952, and we, my folks uh, bought the Rose Farm, which is on the corner of Hancock and Lehman, um, not Lehman, uh, Lamus, and uh, that's where they moved to while I was in the service overseas. And. Uh, the REA came and they said we're putting lines in, but it'll cost you $100 for the pole to get it to your farm. And my dad says, no, I ain't paying $100. Well, my mother and dad got into quite a discussion about that. But dad held fast until the farm next to us, or down on south of us, um, Napier, Mr. Harry Napier came up and he said to my dad, he says, Hank, we decided we want electricity, but I understand you won't pay for the pole on yours. And he says, uh, well, it was $100, my dad said, and I ain't paying $100. He says, we're getting along all right. Well, Harry says, I'll tell you what, he says, if, would you have him put the pole in for $50? And my dad says, well, yeah, I, I expect maybe we'd do that, but they aren't going to cut down on it. And Harry says, that's all right. He says, I'll give you the other 50, because my wife says, we're going to have it. <laughs> And so they, they did, and then they got the electricity, but my mother told my dad, why didn't you hold out? He'd have probably given you the other 50, <laughs> and you wouldn't have to pay anything. Well, so after that, she was much happier with everything. Um, I can tell you all kinds of stories about G's, but let me, let me just reminisce a little bit about what I can remember about G's. One other thing about Carl, he was a great guy. And he could add up the stuff as it was being laid out on the table in his head faster than either I or ever could add it up on the adding machine. As it was laid out on there, he just came up with it. It, was just, it just amazed me how quick he was in, in doing that sort of thing. Great guy to work for. Uh, and as you all know, I ended up with a licensed funeral director primarily because of Carl, because he helped me with my schooling, paying for my schooling. The only thing I argued about him was when I was making 32 cents an hour. He uh, pulled me aside and said, now, he says, you're not going to get your full check. Uh, what do you mean I'm not going to get my full check? It was only a couple of dollars or so. He said, no, he says, I'm holding out 10% and I'm investing it for you. Well, 
you know, when you're, when you're 17 or 18 years old, you don't, well, 16 years old, really, and, and after that. And he said, no, I'm putting that into Investors Diversified, and that's going to be yours, and it'll grow rapidly, and you'll be happy to do it. Well, I never was until um, when I came back from the service, I needed some money, and by golly, there it was, and it was all because of Carl. And he, he didn't talk to me about it, he just told me he's going to do it, you know. <laughs> well, you've heard where all the places were. Uh, one of them that uh, I used to work at the A&P. Remember the A&P store was? Bud Kunis was the manager at that time, and Mary Morningstar was the cashier. And I was the stock boy and, and uh, the um, vegetable, uh, what did, green goods uh, take care of. Yeah, produce, and we had a little misty thing that was over the counter and you had to make sure that was clean so the mist was nice and kept the vegetables all nice. But Bud, Bud Kunis and Mary were, what do I want to say? adversarial from the beginning when I worked there. And I, I probably shouldn't say this, but Mary could cuss more than any mule skinner. And Bud Kunis was her equal. And when they got in it on to something, the ears of a young boy got very red because they didn't pull any punches, but they were very good when customers were in the store. So you know, nobody else knew it except when I was over at the counter and doing what I had to do, and I'd hear those two up in the front going at it, I thought, man, oh man, I've never heard anybody talk like that before. Well, but then I used to take my lunch at uh, Lil Rantham's. You remember Lil had a little restaurant there, and uh, I guess it's where uh, Pitkins got their store, new store now, right? That was, a, wasn't that Lil's? Yeah. And uh, that was a great place to go. But of course, working at G's, the other place I went was Dowker's. And uh, most of you know that uh, we Montague boys kind of had a thing about Whitehall girls, you know, that was kind of a, not supposed to cross the bridge, you know, all that kind of stuff back then, anyway. Um, but I used to get one heaping big malted when I went in there from a certain gal behind the counter. And one day she threw the counter wiping rag at me, and it hit me, and I thought, doggone, somebody's got to tame that gal. <laughs> and so I did, and I finally asked her to marry me. She said yes, and we, we've gone from there. In Montague, what I remember fondly is old uh, Fred Sweet's general store. And anybody remember Fred Sweet in the general store? There's somebody way in the back. Fred's general store was a general store. I mean, it had everything from clothing to uh, food to meat to uh, lamps to fuel oil. My brother Wayne was uh, about five, six years old, I think, and winter was coming. He didn't have any long underwear. So Friday nights was a big night in Montague. Friday night, the family went downtown. Mother went shopping over to Sweets. Dad went over to Happy Crawls for his beer. And us kids all went down to Olson's Barber Shop because the Chamber of Commerce had free movies on the side of the building. Okay. Great night. I mean, it was just great. Well, we went, Mother and Wayne and I were down there, and we went into Sweets because we always had to get some candy to take over to see the show. And she asked uh, Sweet if he had any underwear left for little kid or small kids. Oh yeah, he says, I, I'm sure I got some up there. He says, it's getting toward winter. So he got up on the ladder and the top shelf and pulled down a box and by golly, there was a set of long Johns, wool. Ma says, I'll take them, they'll fit, that's the right size. Well, we got home and she says, now I want you to try these on. Well, Wayne pulled them on, and they had feet in them. 
He said, I ain't wearing these to school. I'm not wearing anything with feet in them. I said, but it's just, no, no. You know, you had the trap door in them and everything else. No, nope, he wasn't going to wear them. He finally talked Grandma into cutting the feet out and hemming them. But he wore them and then itched all winter long, as we all did in those kind of darn things. Uh, Fred's uh, son was our mailman. Or, I'm sorry, Fred was the mailman. Bill was, Bill Sweet was the father. Bill was at the, at the grocery store. Fred was the mailman. Fred used to get to our house, out to the farm, out to our place in the wintertime, and he'd toot the horn two times. Dad would go out and open the barn door, and Fred would pull in and put the chains on his car because we had a hoist in the barn, and he could hook the cup, lift back into his car up and put the chains on to do the rest of his route up into Oceana County, and just as uh, regular as clockwork almost. And, I asked him once, I said, why don't you do that downtown before you ever start out? He says, no place to lift it. <laughs> so those were the kinds of things. Well, Roger put down here some things. Let me see. One of them is uh, what significant childhood events. Well, as I said, you know, I spent every summer as long back as I can remember uh, hunting and fishing and riding horses and swimming and just doing all the kinds of things that kids did at that time. When I was 14, my grandpa decided it was time for me to learn how to plow, and of course we were still, he was still using horse. And if any of you have ever tried to handle a single blade plow behind a Belgian horse, which takes force to get the, the shoe into the ground, and at 14, I probably weighed 90 pounds, maybe 80 pounds. I was a skinny kid, and I could not keep that damn plow in the ground. And Grandpa says, you just aim for that. See that tree down there? Yeah. You just go right for that, and you'll plow a beautiful straight furrow. Well, I started out, I, I plowed a furrow all right. Half of it was a furrow, half of it wasn't a furrow, half of it was on the ground, half of it was stuck into the ground, the horse couldn't even move it. But I learned how to plow. Uh, it, it took me some time to do it, but at that time there was, we didn't have a tractor. Grandpa wouldn't buy a tractor even when they were available. And uh, so, family's role in the community, well, as you all know, uh, Starting with my father, he was a deputy, special deputy sheriff, and ran the uh, the um, system for both fire and police in Montague. And my brothers and uh, nephews and nieces and sons and everybody have been, been involved. Favorite place in the White Lake area? Um, I guess it would be back on the farm where I planted, in 1947, I planted 2,000 pine trees behind the house, behind the barn. And I guess uh, my favorite place is just walking through there now and just seeing little stubs that I stuck in the ground, beautiful pines that are just straight as a whip and probably could build a, <coughs> build a very nice log cabin if I wanted to. Favorite people while growing up? Well, I've already mentioned Carl and Everett. Everett was, to me, one of the most gentle, um, admirable persons uh, that I ever knew. He was the most gracious funeral director, and I worked for a number of them during my career when I was licensed. He was the most gracious funeral director that I have ever met or seen operate. I've never seen anyone else. Many people thought he was different, and he was. But his difference was, I never heard him say a mean word about a person. I never heard him swear. I, he was just a guy that uh, inspired me to be as good a person as he was. Um, his, his handling of a funeral the, from the very embalming of the body in the embalming area was always one of graciousness and concern not only for the people who were mourning 
but for the person that we were working on to, uh, to prepare for the burial. Great guy. And uh, it irks me once in a while when I hear someone criticize him for opening a door. He would always open the door. You, you couldn't get out of a car in a funeral line without ever running up there making sure that the family's door was open before they got out of the car. And that sort of thing just unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, who else did I admire? Well, Adolf Ant Oh, I want to tell you another story about Carl. <laughs> One day I was in the store, and over on the corner by the bank was a bench. And on that bench was Charlie Ruggles. Um, who else was over there? Charlie Ruggles was from the insurance. Anyway, there was three or four of the older men, about Carl's age, really, over there. And um, who was it that came in? I think it was Mr. Nelson from the store across the street came in. Carl was in the front window looking out over to the bank where those guys were sitting. And Mr. Nelson says, Carl, what are you doing? Figuring your income tax for this year? Carl says, what are you talking about? Well, you're counting those old guys sitting on that bench, aren't you? <laughs> Carl, Carl got a little upset. But since he and Mr. Nelson were pretty good friends, he kind of chuckled afterward. He says, no, he says, I just was wondering what they're talking about today. But uh, the other thing, I used to always have to count how many bamboo fishing poles were still in the hoop outside the door on a Monday morning, because we never took them in. We had a big hoop on the side of the building, and in there was all the bamboo fishing poles. We didn't lose very many. Once in a while, there'd be a couple of them gone and no, no dollar left or whatever it was, 50 cents. Adolph Anderson was a guy that uh, I also admired. He was, uh, of course, the uh, president of the bank in Montague, along with <coughs> Joe Akabak, who was at that time, I think, president, about the same time was president in Whitehall. I worked at the Parker Dairy. Remember the Parker Dairy out on Whitbeck Road? Yeah. Um, I worked there, the yeah, building is still there, I worked there for two years when milking machines first came out. And uh, if you remember, the first milking machines weren't really efficient, so you had to strip the cow after you used the milking machine, and that was a job that I just did not like. I, I'd rather milk a cow right from the beginning as to just work it toward the end. And we never had cows on the farm. My mother didn't like the way cows smelled. She would not have a cow on the farm. Fortunately, the Mowers, Ed Mowers and his mother, who lived on the northwest corner of uh, Hancock, just across the road from us, he had two Jersey cows, beautiful little Jerseys, and he gave great milk, lots of cream. Ed was handicapped. Um, from an unfortunate accident. His father whipped him with a buggy whip once as a boy when he did something. He went upstairs and went to bed and when he came down the next morning he was paralyzed on the left side. And uh, Ed never married, of course, and walked with a very bad limp. But he and his mother were there. So we would get the milk from them and we had lots of chickens and so they would get the chickens and eggs from us. It never cost us a nickel, it was just a back and forth. You know, you get, you get the chicken and eggs and we get the milk and cream. So that's the way it went at those times. Um, outstanding events in Montague? Well, like in Whitehall, the homecoming was always a big event. I mean, that, it was a big event to close the street down just like we do now. Uh, Friday movies. Um, what else? What about the Franklin House fire? The Franklin House fire was a big fire. And uh, I was down there all by myself uh, when it first started because I was <clears throat> on duty that night. And I don't remember who turned the alarm in, but I knew that it was going to go down. Uh, there was no question in my mind that it was a goner. And if you see one of the pictures that was taken, you'll see me standing all by myself. There's only one fire truck there at the time, standing in the middle of Ferry and Dowling Street, 
looking at the hotel as it's burning up. That was a, a bad, bad situation. Does anybody else have any comment? Roger, I, I, I have been sitting here trying to get courage to, to tell of the occasion that happened in high school when I was a senior. Uh, we had a superintendent that, we, that everybody didn't like. We didn't like him at all. And this one chap, he decided he was going to fix it. So at Christmas time, he went out and picked up three droppings from a horse and put them in the box. And he, he put a, a piece of paper in there with a note on it, wrapped it all up pretty, and put it under the Christmas tree. Of course, the superintendent always opened his gifts at Christmas time. And he opened it up from one horse's ass to another. Takes care of that end of the table, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, looking left over here, uh, Miriam Blanche. Okay. Lots of reading, lots of reminiscence, but uh, got to be another time. Okay. <laughs> Roger. Yes. I might tell. Okay, that. when Miriam. Gustav was my grandfather, but Gustav was my grandfather. Pauline was his sister. She married Barney Ackerman and they built a farm up where Heartland is now, where I'm reciting. <laughs> so quite ironic. It's gone wheels oh. gone round. <laughs> okay, then I said also at the end there'd be questions if you'd like to ask specific questions to any one of the members. I have one thing to say. Okay. Henry only told a part of the story. Oh. No. Yeah. His mother planted lilacs all through that woods. <laughs> when the, I used to visit to her when she was up to Heartland. Well, where, where is that, Henry? Right on the corner of Lamus and Hancock. Hancock. Oh, right. Blue house, gray house. <laughs> Actually, planting hollyhocks in the woods is rather a novel thing. Today, they'd be planting something else. I lilac. <laughs> we won't go there, okay. Um, other comments? Questions? I thought there was a myrtle. No, no, no. No, hollyhocks, because they grew high and hid it. Actually, you know, if you're out in the country and you're driving along and you do see something like, uh, like a patch of myrtle or also like lilac, lilac bushes, uh, chances are there was an old farmhouse. You know, you see the old the old trees standing there. And there's always the clues, and um, yeah. Um, any other comments? Yes. Do we have time for a song? A song? Sure. Who's going to sing it? Dexter. Dexter. Oh, Dexter. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you remember my first real friend or not. But her name was Flamin' Mamie. Oh, yes. <laughs> they call her Flamin' Mamie, the surefire vamp, the hottest baby in town. She's a heart scorcher, she's a human torture, she's a gale at brown down. Now of all those damp and turning mamas, not one compares. For she carries fire insurance on everything she wears, which isn't much. And when it comes to loving, she's a human oven, but she's hard to understand. Now, it may sound funny, but paper money would burn right in her hand. And the fireman so old that he had to retire. Said she's the hottest thing he's seen since the Chicago fire. They call her flaming mammy, the surefire band. The hottest little baby in town, I don't mean maybe. 
the hardest little baby in town. Hey, hey. You know, when, when we talk about the King family, uh, we all remember Junior King, Junior King, Lee King, and the bands. And I, I see Mary Lee back there, and, and you know, they always put down at Murray's. And uh, I, I think music somehow uh, is in the King family. <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, who else? What else? Jean, do you want to... Well, just please, uh, if you are through... I, I, I think we are, are we yeah. through? Help yourself to the refreshments that are over there because there's all kinds of cookies. And I, I, just, I just have one question. Okay. Yeah. I know we, uh, Henry was a big part of starting the whole pumpkin roll, which of course oh. is coming up again. When did that actually, when did kids actually start rolling pumpkins down that hill? <laughs> Before I did. <laughs> <laughs> so a long time ago. Yeah. It, that was on a long time because it, it was something that I partook in too before it was uh, permitted. I, I was one of them that that uh, Louis Buttleman used to chase. Louis Buttleman was our constable and um, one time we he used to park his vehicle down at Orenberger's which is where a T car is now, Ornberger's gas station, Shell station. And he was out checking doors, so we got a couple of cement blocks and lifted the rear wheels just off the ground. <laughs> and then we went up the top of the hill and rolled a bunch of pumpkins down. And he knew we were on the top of the hill, so he got in his car and he put her in gear and boy, <laughs> he didn't go anywhere. So we walked down nonchalantly downtown, gave him a hand and put his car back on the road. Kinder was gentler Great story. Then, then I ended up being a policeman. <laughs> In the early 30s, we started playing at the Jack and Jill Ranch. And we played out there for about 35 years. And the reason I say that is some of the girls out there married fellas from this area. Benny Schultz's Benny Schultz wife came from there. And uh, I, I went to the jazz concert Sunday with my son-in-law over at the Oak Ridge Country Club. And there was two fellas came up and said, Dexter, I can remember when we used to come out, and before we were married, when we used to come out to Jack and Jill Ranch. We had to get passes to get in to begin with, and if we wanted to date any of the girls, we had to get date passes. We put our, our license, car license on them and our driver's license, and if there was any hanky-panky, they just tore up our passes, and we weren't allowed out there anymore. So, Who's in the picture, Dexter? There was usually quite a few fellas from this area that came there uh, because there was 250 guests and about 175 of them were women. So we needed some fellas to, to come out to dance. And the fellas came from North Muskegon, from Shelby and Hart and Fremont, Whitehall and Montague. And they had a good time out there. But the girls from town didn't like it because their boyfriends were going out there on Tuesdays. We started playing Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And then we ended up playing just Thursday and Sunday for, for 35 years. But we had a lot of fun out there. Let me just add to that, during the Second World War, when it was only ladies out of Jack and Joe, practically even probably closer to 100%, they used to send a bus down to White Lake and take us senior high schoolers out there to dance with the girls. But I don't, none of my classmates hitched up with any of them. We all ended up here. In fact, our motto for graduation was rowing, not drifting. But out of 32 of us who graduated, I think only three rowed because most of us stayed right here in White Lake. Okay, um, 
I, I, I just a comment about uh, Henry talking about the, the Louis the Law. We call I, our generation called him Louis the Law. <clears throat> the nice thing about Louis the Law was he was always parked down uh, by Banks Delivery Barn or whatever across the street, and so like you knew immediately where the cop was. There was only one, <laughs> and so uh, you know you could sort of um, misbehave elsewhere. Um, Louis used to get us in as much trouble as he got us out. We'd be down to Green Haven eating, and he'd say, you know, so-and-so up there's got a beautiful punk, a batch of pumpkins. Then he'd go up and wait for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Whitehall cop, he had a little old hat and a little old coop and everything, but I, I'm trying to think of his name, Raleigh, Raleigh Merrick. Raleigh Merrick. Raleigh was, yeah, and he had a white uniform for summers, remember when the tourists came? He had a white outfit, white hat, really spiffy in this small town, boy. What kind of a car would you call that little thing? With a Chevrolet. But I mean, it was the two-door little coupe thing. Cool. It was a roadster, wasn't it? With a rumble seat. With a rumble seat. Right, with a rumble seat. Where could he put his prisoners? We didn't take prisoners. Oh. <laughs> uh, Whitehall didn't have a job, or a jail. Montague did have a jail in the back of the fire station. We used to have a jail. Where was it? It's on the old city hall. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, I never saw the one in the Whitehall. Wasn't yeah. as fancy. Wasn't as good as ours. Ours was bigger. <laughs> <laughs> you had more taverns over here, but we had bigger jails over there. Rolly forgot to take He forgot to take One night he put a guy in there and he forgot to go through him. And that door, I think, is eight inches back there in the jail. And when he got there in the morning, that guy down there carved through that door to get at the latch. He used to take us in there all the time and show us that garbage. Okay, I, I, any other comments? Uh, thank you for, for your patience on Saturday night. I, I, I'm, I'm glad they put this panel together, the Sesquicentennial Committee, because basically there are some good stories. And... Um, and we shall all should kind of know more about the area, et cetera. I always I have a kind of old city planning background. I always feel that the more people know about a place, the more they respect it, the more they appreciate it. And uh, that's to me, that's a great role of the historical society, it's just to keep all the yarns and the stories going and, uh, and realize that we do live in a very special place. So uh, thank you. And Jean? Just now, drive safely and have a cookie.